you will probably, it's well known in Corby, and you probably know Spike as Spike the poet, Spike the taxi driver, but tonight Spike will be talking to you as, um, as an ex-soldier, um, ex-Scots Guard, British Army, um, and he will be speaking in conversation with Pat McGee. Uh, Pat was released from prison following the Good Friday Agreement, a member of the IRA, IRA for many years. And um, on his release in 1999, Pat's journey took a very different way and, and his journey towards peace and reconciliation started. And Pat and Spike met each other through an organization called Veterans for Peace. And some of, some of the lads are here tonight, and I welcome you. It's good to see you here. And they met through that organization through their shared work in, in the UK and in Belfast. Um, but tonight they're going to be in conversation with each other, which is the first time that they've done this. Um, and so I'd like to welcome them up. And if everyone could give them a big call of welcome. Bright lights. <laughs> speak first? Right? Yes, Pat, please. Yeah. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, several reasons. But I'm not going to fool you by saying that this isn't difficult. Um, I find it very difficult. Things I have to talk about will challenge some of you, I, I suspect. And also, um, even though I've heard Madeline's story before, you can't sit and listen to that story and just collect your thoughts, you know, over 15 minutes. So this is tough. I'm Patrick McGee. I was born in Belfast. At four I came over to England. Now that has a relevance uh, that I'll explain. Between four and 19 I was brought up in England. But it was a bit of a tear away and... Uh, I ended up in an approved school, and there was a senior approved school. I would have been about 16 going in, and the idea is you come out at 18 reformed. Uh, while there, um, I wangled my way into a day release to Corby, a school in Corby. And for about, I think, a three-month period, I would have attended a local school for twice a week for about I was at three months and formed friendships at that age, I was being about 18, which I still remember. Um, it, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name. I think it was called uh, Pope John the 23rd Comprehensive. Perhaps some of you may know that. It was a brilliant school. It was my first uh, real experience of a good school. Uh, I left school when I was 13. I mean, I was, as I said, I was a wee bit of a tear away. Uh, very sadly to report, um, some of the friends, this may touch a note, but three or four of them died a few months after I left in some awful accident at the side of a road. So about three or four kids from the local area all died. That's it. Lives extinguished. And uh, I probably haven't thought about that uh, uh, in a long, long time, but now I'm remembering it. So coming back here has that. The other thing I would want to say about it is, I was about 18 when I was here. Now, two years later, I found myself back in Belfast. And I'm thinking, those two years, all that happened in between. In between me being here in Corby, which was a good, sound, positive memory that I still, you know, is, is positive in my life. And then... Two years later, it's as if I'm in a different universe. It's, an, it's a universe of conflict. I'm uh, living in a place called uh, Unity Flats. Uh, in the day, I'm talking about, about 1971, 72, it was a real flashpoint. I mean, there would have been rats, serious rats, on a regular basis. 
it, uh, fo it was a small, let me call it, nationalist Catholic enclave of about 300 residences right at the base of the main unionist Protestant heartland. And it was a thorn in its side, so there was constant attention. I used uh, terms like Protestant, Catholic, Unionist, Nationalist in very broad stroke terms. But that, that is just a simple way of uh, explaining you know, why this was such a, like a really tough area. And that area found itself under siege, and it was also occupied. I mean, there was a permanent um, army encampment within that small area, constant patrolling in it. And I wasn't long back from England, um, trying to understand the situation. I didn't return to Ireland to get involved in violence. I think I wanted to just understand it, and perhaps um, play some role in making things better. But I didn't, certainly didn't think that role would be involvement in the Irish Republican Army. But seeing how um, just the people of that district um, <coughs> collectively took on the might of the British state, I found very uh, impressive. And after a while, I, I found I couldn't, uh, I couldn't s stand back and <coughs> not do anything. Uh, and, it, and again, I emphasise the point. This is about two years after being here. Um, you know, think of that. Yeah. Well, um, I don't have the time here to go into everything about that period. You are quite entitled to ask me questions following this. I, uh, I was uh, a member of the Irish Republican Army for 27 years, 17 of which were spent <coughs> in various prisons. Um, uh, when you're in prison as an Irish Republican, that's another war, uh, it's another front in our struggle, another war. You're still fighting that same state. But because of the uh, Good Friday Agreement, uh, I found myself released decades before the state had intended initially. When they sentenced me, um, I ended up getting a, um, a recommendation that I shouldn't be released until it served 50 years. Uh, that's called the tariff. But in fact, I only uh, uh, did 14 years. So I'm coming out into this new political dispensation of peace building. And well, look, there's something we call get fever. It's that anticipation of release. And you're thinking, what am I going to do when I get out of prison? Any skill I had was now redundant in terms of, uh, I mean, there's no role for me in the, like a, 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 the armed struggle. You're thinking, what can I now do as an Irish Republican to cement the peace, further it? And one thing uh, I think I readily grasped at the time uh, and would have anticipated and say, yes, this is something I can do. I could have imagined me sitting around a table with squatties, <coughs> or RUC people, or the various shades of uh, loyalism that we were in conflict with, or um, those uh, uh, groupings of the Republicans we had, we had feuds with, all the combatants, all the contributors to that conflict. I thought, this is one thing that needs to be done. We have to sit around a table and uh, talk. Um, because when you're involved in conflict, that's nigh impossible. There's just no space for it. Even in prison, you might think that prison would provide um, um, some scope for um, introspection, for um, thinking over matters, reappraising the past. But as I said, for us, it was another front in that conflict we are still at war. So there is this massive opportunity now to address some of uh, what 
that now gets called legacy issues. Talking to the uh, former protagonists of that conflict, talking also in addressing needs of victims, etc. All the stuff that couldn't be dealt with in the throes of conflict. And uh, not long after I got out of jail, uh, Don has mentioned I got out in 1999, but not long after that I did start uh, the, that process, uh, particularly with victims. Uh, and I've been doing that now for um, it's coming up to 16 years. I've been meeting victims 16 years. Talking to a lot of people <coughs> in the same period. But one of the um, most positive things uh, that I now do uh, it's only happened quite late, and that is meeting on a more kind of a regular basis, ex squaddies, former British Army personnel. Occasionally during the years I would have been in uh, a conversation with some, but in a formal way, it's only happened in, uh, recently. And uh, I can remember the first time it happened. Uh, I couldn't be precise about the date. October 2014. There you go. <laughs> and that was less than two years ago. The, uh, I'm invited along to a room, uh, a discussion with ex squaddies in uh, Queen's University, Belfast. I was told there was a group and uh, go along and talk to them. But, and uh, I, I was, to be honest, I, I was ready for it. This is something, this is great. And, th and then you're in the presence of these guys, and you're, you're hearing them tell the stories. Now, let me, let me say some of them are in the audience here tonight. Uh, and they've uh, come from various different regiments. Uh, they would have been uh, posted to the north of Ireland at different stages. So there's a wealth of experience spread out. Because that conflict went on for decades, as we know. And I'm listening to their stories. And one of the things that really um, I hadn't fully uh, anticipated, hadn't, uh, because you're sitting there and you're listening to them and you're responding to their questions, etc., and you're, you're, you're weighing up. You're looking at them and you're weighing them up. And they're weighing you up, you know. And it, it, as if I could make a link with every single one of them with somebody I knew. Um, somebody I knew in Belfast who had been a Republican or had been you know, in the conflict, or in, in jail. You know, in, in that moment, you know, the, I can imagine uh, being a British, in the British Army. I can, I can remember a, a time when I would have been about, let me see, about 16, I had uh, mates who joined the British Army. Sometimes that was a, a way of getting out of, uh, uh, you know, like a, a jail sentence or something, you know, where, you know, if you get out of a preschool if you go and join the, you know, the British Army. So it, it was something that could have been on the cards. So I knew guys that joined it. And it was, it was one of the sad <coughs> things in the middle of that conflict is that the nearer you, nearest day now you would have got to them is uh, with them shielded with a uniform when you're not seeing them in their full humanity. You know, all you're seeing is the uniform. Uh, to the point where they're dehumanized. Uh, I think uh, I first got an inkling of this by meeting victims and hearing some of their stories, where uh, the first time I began to recognize something in me that uh, had been taken. That is, in the middle of conflict, you reduce things to the point is you blinker off the people who are in conflict with to the extent that you don't see them in their full humanity. And that is, has to be at the cost of your own humanity. In reducing them, you've reduced yourself. Uh, that's perhaps the only way you can um, deal with conflict. You know, but here now, there's this expansion, this getting to know, this getting to understand, and it happens through dialogue. It, it happens to, it happens through um, being open to the uh, other story, also open to your own story. By that I mean um, the um, 
recognizing the need to look back over your own actions and to really objectively examine them as honestly as you are capable of doing. Asking yourself dif uh, difficult questions um, like, uh, was there another way? Um, I can remember a time when I would have been so absolutely certain that we had no other recourse but to take up arms against the British state. Uh, I don't think there's my core um, values and political beliefs have changed, but I am open to the possibility that there were other ways open to us. And I think we have to develop that frame of mind, not only Republicans, all sides. That is assisted by conversation, by dialogue, by getting to know the other, by explaining yourself and listening to the other's perspective. That's why it's a very um, enriching experience for me to have met the veterans that I've met, that have met Spike, and why I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be here tonight and share a platform. Thank you. <laughs> well, my journey to the British Army is pretty similar. Um, <clears throat> I think I was destined to join the Army for the youngest age because it's kind of drummed into you. You watch all these Hollywood movies, you've got your action man doll, you've got your guns and you play at soldiers and... Uh, is all, are you tough enough to do it and are you brave enough to do it? And so you've got all this stereotype bullshit going on as a young person. So it kind of pushes you towards being a soldier, you know, wearing that uniform, being something to be proud of, that you, to prove to my father that I was tough enough to do it. And it all came to be, I tried three times to join the army. I tried when I was 16, but my school record was awful and they thought I'd desert very quickly. I tried when I was 18, but then I had a record for violence, and, didn't, and you can't have violent people in the army after all. <laughs> and I, I joined when I was 20. Well, I was living in London at the time, and uh, I was working as a security guard. And my boss at the time, chap sitting in the audience, Gordon, was a former Scots guard. Now, he kind of saw the direction I was going in, uh, drugs, alcohol, which was to resurface again later on, but uh, the, the drugs I was using were really heavy. I'm talking about heroin. Uh, and through his guidance, I ended up joining the Scots Guards. And uh, I ended up in Brookwood, the end of the earth, at the Guards Depot, which had hell written over it, and uh, Satan standing at the gates with <laughs> a scythe. And, uh, but I got through it because I was pretty fit. I'd got myself fit. I used to run a lot and I'd, I'd always played football and long distance running at school and I was a good swimmer. So I was fortunate I had experience of living on my own. When I joined uh, the Guards Depot, there was guys that basically arrived in su with suitcases that their, their mothers had packed for them. They'd basically just left their mother's bosom. You could hear them crying at night, you know, and it was... Uh, so anyway, I can't go into too much detail about basic training because we haven't got the time. Um, we had two options when we finished to join the 1st Battalion Scots Guards or the 2nd Battalion Scots Guards. Now Gordon had given me the in inside info that we were off to Hong Kong for two years after an almost a year stint in Belfast. I thought, hmm, fancy Hong Kong. And uh, so I was off to Belfast. First time ever on a plane from Heathrow to Belfast. I'm sitting on the plane thinking, good move. You're off to a war situation. And a war that I knew very, very little about. I knew who the IRA were. I was brought up as a Protestant uh, in Glasgow. I, I was used to all the, the, the sectarian bullshit in Glasgow. Fenian bastard, orange bastard, and all the rest of it. And I was led to believe it was just a few nutters, Republican nutters, that were responsible for what was going on. And uh, when I got there, a completely different picture appeared. 
it was entire communities hated me, hated my uniform. That took a lot to, to take in. I was, oh, I'm just a guy, you know. But these, you know, that this thing had been going on for so many years. And to find yourself in the middle of it at the age of 21 was quite a blow. It was quite, quite a shock to the system. Although as a young soldier, you, you deny that at the time because you're kind of gung-ho. You want to prove yourself. At that time in 1981, there was a guy called Bobby Sands who uh, had gone on hunger strike. And I had no concept of what they were actually protesting about, political status. To me, they were just killers. Like Pat had, had, uh, talked about earlier, I had dehumanised the Republicans. To me, they were the enemy. They were scum. They were to be wiped out because this was my defence mechanism towards the hatred that was coming towards me. So we endured... Uh, the hunger strike was... A tinderbox situation. Ten guys starved themselves to death in that a very short period of time, and it reshaped the whole thinking worldwide of the situation in the north of Ireland. Now, I left the army in 1985, and uh, I thought, "Great, I'm out, I'm free." But inside, there was all this rage and turmoil. And I think I used my loathing and hatred towards the Republicans as a catalyst to the rage I was feeling anyway. I, I was quite an angry person anyway because I'd been brought up with violence. And anything <coughs> Republican or anything Irish would uh, promote so much anger in me. And this anger led me onto a, a path of self-destruction of alcohol and cocaine and ecstasy and cannabis and fighting. If you looked at me the wrong way, I'd fucking nut you. You know, I very nearly went to prison because of acts of violence. <coughs> I was carrying, as Madeline addressed earlier, I was carrying all this rage within me. And uh, I began to realise as years went by, there's got to be more to this than what I'm feeling. And I started to get a better understanding of Irish history. And uh, I'd calmed down pretty much in my 40s. Uh, I was on a pretty much a self-destruction path in my 40s. When I got to my late 40s, I began to waken up a wee bit. I stopped using the drugs and I stopped going on three, four day binges. Uh, stopped smoking weed. And um, I began to read and understand what had been going on in that part of the world. And as I developed politically, uh, as the socialist within me began to understand when a, a people are being not allowed their basic human and civil rights, then they have a right to a voice and they have a right to take some sort of action to address that. I was then watching YouTube and there was a chap from Veterans for Peace, Ben, he's in the audience. Um, he was speaking at Oxford University. And it was like, it wasn't so much an epiphany. It was everything this man was talking about, I was applauding. I actually stood up watching my laptop, thinking, yes. You know, and I joined Veterans for Peace. And uh, we went to the AGM, and uh, there was a guy called Lee Lavis was speaking about his work in Belfast. Of course, my ears pricked up. <coughs> Is there any questions? I goes, woof, <laughs> I want to get involved with what you're doing. I want to, I want to go back there. I, I remember leaving Belfast December 1981 so I never want to see this shithole again. As long as I live, I don't want to come back. But as I grew as a human being, I, I, something within me, I, I knew I would end up back in Belfast as a man of peace. So I returned there in August 2014. Before my feet had touched the ground off the tar on the tarmac at the airport, Lee had whisked me off. And uh, the first venue was to see Pat speaking with Joe Berry. And I was like, wow, this is quite something to listen to their shared humanity. And the, the whole thing started to roll from there. And at the time Pat's talking about was October 2014 when eight of us, there's four of us here, I think, walked into this room and Pat and Joe were sitting there. And um, 
We've met several times since, and just not just listening to Pat, but listening to other former Republican prisoners and uh, walking around the streets that I used to patrol in the Divis Flats and the Falls Road and the outskirts of the Ardoin. It's still not quite safe for ex-soldiers to walk through there. Uh, but listening to people's shared stories, everybody suffered. I have yet to meet somebody in Belfast that hasn't experienced loss to one degree or another. You're a, 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 a close family member or a cousin. Or the, the graveyards are full. It doesn't matter what Catholic, Protestant, Loyalist, Republican, British soldier, all victims. So that's how myself and Pat, we've, we've met several times now, and we got on. And it's amazing how when you put a face on the enemy, that person stops being the enemy. And you, you, you have an understanding of each other. And uh, here we are today, sharing our stories. Pat. Yeah. <clears throat> I, know, I know it's... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, t I'm talking to the, 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 the veterans, and you know it was impossible to have those conversations when you're wearing the uniform in those streets. It's impossible. That's, that's the real um, enormous um, sadness that I, I feel when I think about that. And you, know, you wonder, you know, what was preventing that happening? Well, you know, there are vested interests there that were there to stop that happening. And uh, as I said, the, the, these conversations can only happen in, in uh, circumstances of relative peace, at least. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the pity. I don't think, um, if I can make a, 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 like a point here, I, I don't think you should wait to, uh, uh, to come out of conflict before you begin the process of getting to know the, this other. I think that should start, uh, you can say it should start during the conflict. Better than that, it should start before the conflict mm -hmm. begins. You know, that's the sadness about it. Because every one of the, the guys I've met, they all come from similar backgrounds to me. I mean, we're all, uh, I think without exception, they seem, seem to be the ones I've met. They all come from like working class, you know, like uh, like urban environments, you know, with uh, tough times, tough cities, Belfast, Newcastle, Birmingham, you know, the, you know the full gamut, you know, of, ne of neglect and you know, and uh, you know all these uh, ter terrible disparities in wealth, you know, recruiting sergeants for the British Army, recruiting sergeants for you know um, the struggle, all of that. It's it's uh, how do you, uh, I kind of lost track here, to be perfectly honest. Um, you, you, you mustn't think for one second you come here, you know, with a prepared script, but you can't. You can't do that. You can't, and you certainly can't do it after sitting here and listening to something as powerful as uh, as Madeline's uh, you know, story. But I, I just want you. I want to share this this profound sense of um, loss that I feel over the fact that it took so long be in a situation where we can have conversations like this, you know. You know, that uh, you, you say to yourself, how can you ensure that nobody has to go through this again and come through to the other point where they get this realisation that we should be having the conversation back at this moment? That's where we are. I mean, a lot of the stuff I do now is going into the other communities and... Um, meeting victims, um, talking, explaining, trying to come up with alternatives, you know. Um, I would say to anybody looking, uh, the big lesson I've learned is, you know, never give up exploring for those old alternatives, you know. Because you can do everything in your power possible to avoid coming to the conclusion that all you've got is... Uh, through a position of weakness, let's say, is your ability to defend yourself, you know. Never get to that moment, you know. The, f the fact that, um, just talking about my own journey, mm -hmm. 20, 20 years ago, there's no way on earth I could have sat here with Pat, because <coughs> my mind wasn't ready for it, so maybe Pat was the same 20 odd years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, even the sight of an Irish flag would enrage me, and... Um, so just on a personal note, step by step towards understanding 
and uh, if we can reach out and see other people that are consumed with hatred and anger and rage and say, it doesn't have to be that way. We can sit around, talk, dialogue, as Pat said, and come to a peaceful resolution to any conflict. That's, that's my hope. I want to be doing more of this and I want to be doing helping people reconcile with themselves and understand themselves that hatred only does damage to the person that's feeling the hatred. Let it go and let's move forward. The one thing I can definitely say is um, I don't hold um, any animosity. I can't remember the last time I did actually hold any kind of grudge or animosity towards you know, the, our former um, enemies. I mean, it's way, way beyond that, you know. That's, uh, that's some progress. But I, 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 just listening to, to you talk, respect, I'm reminded of something that I did just a few weeks ago. And that is, uh, it was on my birthday, um, just the end of May there. It was over 64. The, uh, 60, <laughs> 65, <laughs> But uh, I, was, I was in uh, northern France, Flanders. And for the first time I was there, it was the first time I was there, something I wanted to do for quite a long time. And that is a visit the grave of a, a great uncle. Now, it, it, it has uh, an additional uh, significance other than the blood tie than that I was named after him. Uh, yeah. And I wanted to be there. Went out, and it's a very powerful thing. I found a very powerful standing beside this uh, very simple, you know, white stone marker with my name on it. You know, because I'm named after my great uncle. He was 19, he was killed. I'm guessing, I don't know the full facts, but uh, because of the, the, the situation of the uh, cemetery and the date he died, I would assume, and the regiment he was in at the time, it was the Royal Irish uh, Fusiliers, uh, it, the evidence is that he was at Ganshi, it was one of the last engagements of the, of the Somme campaign. And, uh, I think he must have been wounded, and, and it's worse than being killed as being wounded and then dying later, I think, God, you know, the, when you're in that conflict. So it was, I found it very, very deeply moving. And uh, who was, who was a, it's this voyage of discovery. You go back and you try to understand. I mean, you try to understand in the moment, but we're linked to the past, and if you want to get to understand in this moment, you have to understand that past. And so all you do, you're Googling and you're researching and you're Ancestry.com and all of that. And, uh, I, I, the, for instance, this uh, 1911 census uh, attests to the fact that uh, Patrick Joseph McGee, at 13, worked in a local mill. You know, he was a mill worker. And he's dead at 19, you know. So that's, this, is, this is nothing exceptional. This is all our stories. You know, the... I'm, I'm sure there's lots of people in this room can. Uh, it's part of your own um, inheritance, you know. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to piece it together. You know, all these kind of, uh, you know, so many missing bits to that <laughs> account. Because uh, my grandfather, his Patrick McGee's younger brother, uh, joined up the year after. And uh, he, he served in France, and he also served out in India. With, you know, uh, uh, he was in a few regiments, and he ended up being an IRA man. You know, just look at that. You know, the linkage from there to here. So you know, you know, I'm being aware of all that. You know, that uh, there's no difference here. There's no difference. What we need to understand is the context. You know, and the, you know what separated this. You know, but in, in terms of people, our own. We have our own common humanity here, you know. And as I said, that's the strong feeling I got the first time I met these guys in a room in Belfast. There was so much we shared together, you know. And that uniform and that context, those times, separated us. And I so, felt the same. I, I feel like I, 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 can, I can still be roused to anger at the thought of all the machinations and uh, abuses of power that separated us and put us at loggerheads. And it's happening now, still. Yeah. But I can relate to what Pat said. When I sat around the table with former Republicans and we're having tea and sandwiches and it's like you're just like looking at Gordon or 
Oh, Ben, you can relate so much. You can think, what's behind it all? You know, how are we doing? Two minutes. Two minutes, right, and we'll wind it down a wee bit and get some questions and answers. But yeah, I want this journey to continue. I want to keep doing this. And I want to keep opening people up to finding their own selves, as I'm finding myself. That's what I've got, really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Magically appeared. Um, okay, I'm not going to stand up here next to you, but um, just we've got about ten minutes for any questions that you'd like to ask. But probably if you just put your hand, if, wait, yeah, if you if you questions for Pat or Spike, just say who it's for, your name and who the questions for. If it's a general one, then Pat, I'm George. Um, the, the Good Friday Agreement. Um, is it working? Well, I, I would uh, view um, the Good Friday uh, Agreement as a success, and this is why I would say it. Now, we are aware that there are people who don't share that view, but I'm very conscious of where we are now and where we w were then. And I see the centre of Belfast where the kids are out in their skateboards who don't even remember the conflict, and they've claimed ownership to this presence and they don't appear to carry the, you know, the, the heavy burden of the past. That's wonderful. And, uh, well, that was, that was created by people getting around and talking and reaching an accommodation, which was difficult for many people, difficult to implement, difficult to stomach for a lot of people. You know, there's, there's still, uh, the situation there is still very raw. That makes the politics raw as well. But I think, I, I, I see so much to be optimistic about. And I think we're going in the right direction. At the back there. You are, I was to Pat and Spike really, I was on that visit with you, you know, like in Belfast there and um, yeah it's difficult because um since growing up I had this imagination of the IRA man as this guy in a boiler suit with a, with a balaclava on and that carried on through my army career and it was found to be false in 2014 when we went over and actually met former IRA men and found out that actually they were very similar backgrounds to ourselves. I just think, you know, like, how much difference really is there from a working class kid growing up in Belfast to one growing up in London or one growing up in Swansea or Newcastle? And then I think to the situation we're in today where we're told that um, Muslims are this, you know, people from the Middle East, you know, these terrible enemies that we have and, you know, you hear young soldiers now talk about um, ISIS, Islamic State, and, and the you know resistance that went on in Afghanistan and Iraq is in similar ways that we used to talk about the IRA. And um, bearing in mind that 20 years after the conflict, we managed to meet and find out that actually we've got a lot more in common. Sorry, it's a very long question. I'm not. Sure. <laughs> <coughs> it seems to me that there, you know all of this talk of reconciliation and forgiveness, yes, or we haven't talked about forgiveness, but reconciliation. Is that the, the the real sort of like structural enemy is still in the room? You know, the, the real cause of all this is still in the room. The, the people who are pushing us into these wars, the people who are deciding who our enemies are. Mm -hmm. And is it possible for us to um, reconcile that? You know, like you talk about, um, you know, getting over that hatred, you know, but also to maintain the struggle against the people who perpetuate this stuff. That is carrying on well, down in the Middle East and will carry on once they've had enough in the Middle East. We're doing what we can, Ben. We're kind of silenced by a, a, a media that's controlled by the state. So we're shouting against brick walls at times, but we are trying. You know, stop reading the papers, <laughs> the, the mail, the express, or watching the news, or Sky News, or BBC. It's all, it's all bullshit. You know, but we have a voice and we've got to keep using it. And uh, we'll get through eventually, you know. The the evil that governs us cannot perpetuate forever. Uh, we've got the, the, they've got to lose sometime. <coughs> the profiteers of war, I'm talking about. You know, we know who they are. Yeah. 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 Y
I, I could just say it. I think we we um, we have different narratives. We have different viewpoints in the world, different uh, his, histories. You know, n never mind. We will already discuss what's common there. But the fact is, that we uh, there are different contending narratives out there. It's not. It's, it's more complicated than that. There's more power behind some of those stories. They get heard. They're privileged. You know, that's what you have to do. You have to find a way of being heard so that your um, perspective is, is heard. Uh, uh, ben uh, talked about uh, this uh, preconception he had of the typical uh, Irish Republican. I, I, I can uh, say this, uh, that my experience was that the IRA were not this thing parachuted into a problem or some external force of evil. They were the people in the district. And what the IRA was in essence was the people in the district struggling to this context that found themselves uh, under. And uh, they're no different to anybody else. You know. But there is a narrative out there that refutes that and makes it difficult to be heard sometimes, even now, uh, 20 years after the, you know, the peace process. Still, you find yourself having to uh, platforms to idea, actually. You know, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, there may uh, part, it may be difficult for some of you in this room or some people in this town, and I've certainly met opposition in this country, and I speak here, over here on a, on a regular basis. Some people still can't see beyond this uh, demon that they've grown up knowing the IRA man, you know. I've got a question for Pat. Um, my name's Shona. Um, I'm a went to the IRA all them years ago, on a personal level, were you motivated by religion or was it purely political for you personally? Um, it certainly wasn't religion um, and maybe that had something to do with uh, the, uh, something I've already mentioned that has been brought up over here, that uh, although I was born a Catholic uh, at, at, at some very early stage when I think it was about 11 or something, I, I it's like I woke up one day and I no longer believed in the tooth fairy, if you know what I mean. And <laughs> that's what it was like. And uh, so I came back, I come in, back into a situation where the, the world understands it to be a, a conflict between Protestants and Catholics. That's not the way I saw it. It was a political, uh, this was a political conflict. This conflict arose out of an abuse of power. Uh, re re there was a religious dimension to it, but that's not what that conflict was about. This is about coming to Tiles of the Past. Um, how do you feel about being responsible for the killing of like, innocent vic victims mm. compared to the killing of, say, soldiers? What would you say to their families to justify? Or, to, or how did that feel to sort of kill them? Is that a question for both? Have a general question. The, um, that's a very complicated question. I, I wouldn't make any distinction between innocent victims and victims that are culpable, that they were targeted, you know, that, uh, you know, they were l legitimate. I don't make that distinction. I think every death and injury in that conflict from any side is to be regretted, you know. Uh, I feel very um, conflicted about having been in that conflict. And you see the basis of my conf my, this conflict in me is understanding that we had no other option but to take up the struggle, but conflicted because there's this deep regret that that struggle was necessary, and that people were killed because of it. But I wouldn't make a distinction. I think Sorry. when you, 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 you can, if you can find yourself condoning one killing and condemning another, that therein the problem lies. Killing is killing, yeah. you know, across the board. Go forward. I don't know, maybe Ben could answer that one. <laughs> Over to you. I don't know. That would be good. There, there are a, a movement, uh, Israeli, former Israeli soldiers called yeah. Combatants for Peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And uh, are we in touch with them, Ben? Well, what I would say, from our perspective as Veterans of Peace within the United Kingdom, there's also Veterans of Peace in Australia, Ireland and the United um, States. And our main focus is to change our government and to change the war making of our own government. Our own government that has invaded Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, is involved in the attack in Yemen, is involved in the attacks in Somalia. And um, that's our focus. You know, like, we're former British soldiers, and if anything, our power is in challenging that government that we used to serve. And, um, yeah, there's loads of things that we could get into, but in terms of focus and in terms of what we should be really putting our energy into, that's what I think. But obviously there's other perspectives within Veterans of Peace, but I think that's really important that we carry on focusing on that, rather than going on some world tour of, you know, like, uh, oh, you know, imagine us lecturing the Israelis about their attacks on Gaza or this, yeah. when we're involved in an attack on the Yemen, you know, and I'm not sure it would work. Can I just say, I think uh, examples of dialogue are important. Uh, that's what we can share. We can't be, um, how would you put it, what's, what's the term? You know, we can't say this is what you have to do, because all contexts are different. But there's, there's also a commonality there too. You know, there's dissimilarities, but there's also things similar in any uh, context of conflict. And we can offer an example of how people coming out of conflict can meet and talk and understand and try, try to understand each other. And you know we can learn from the, those other contacts too. I've been out in um, um, you know uh, Israel, Palestine, and I've had contacts and shared many platforms with groups like uh, Combatants for Peace and the Family Networks. The one thing you do appreciate, you there is a complete uh, a lack of appreciation of the amount of actual contact that goes on in places like Israel and Palestine. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. They had that election um, a couple of, in recent, recently where um, Sharon got back in. And uh, there was, I know so many people w uh, who were buoyed up at the thought they were going to get into a new, more liberal regime and open up the possibilities for peace. Absolutely devastated that you got a very um, uh, extreme, perhaps a right-wing administration back in power. You know, but all, all, so there, there's a lot going on uh, under the radar you don't perceive with no, with no understanding about. But it's happening at ground level. And this is where we can connect. This is where groups like uh, the Veterans for Peace and uh, ex-Republicans, Irish Republicans, etc. This Our strength comes from that work on the ground. You know, um, uh, what has been achieved in Ireland is as much the result of work done on the ground by the people in the districts as it's did by people in power. You know, and that's the example. Just got a question for Spike. Um, you said earlier on it, it was only sort of in your later years where you started to sort of understand the other side of the fence, if you like, and their position. What was the pivotal moment from you going from enraged at seeing an Irish flag to then being all for peace? What, when, when yeah, well, I didn't have an epiphany. I didn't suddenly wake up one morning and go, ding, I'm cured. It was a, a procession of learning and uh, listening to different people. And the internet's fantastic, you know, because uh, I was very, not very good on the old laptop. I've, I've, I've taught myself and been helped a lot. And um, you get more and more information. You meet people that, that feed you the information. And uh, so even listening to George Galloway on his radio show, I mean, he's not everybody's cup of tea, but I, I admire the way the man speaks and his take on the Irish conflict. And I'm, I'm starting to listen, and little things are beginning to fit together. And uh, so, so it was a, a, a process, not, not an epiphany, a process. We can have one last question. Okay, Gus. Yeah, just... Um some epiphanies, epiphanies. Um, as, as I went over to Belfast last year and uh, did a talk at the Belfast Festival at the Game Club on Paul's Road. And I was asked a question which was an epiphany. And it came to me how stuff is kept in place by the use of language. Terrorist is a big one. When you call somebody a terrorist, it means you're the good guy, he's the bad guy. And I had a question from the audience, and he said, do you consider yourself to be a terrorist as an ex-British Army Royal Engineer in a search team? And in that one question, I saw myself as a 19-year-old kicking doors in, pulling people out of bed, turning houses over, 
um, demonising people. I saw mothers holding the babies, and I saw myself holding <coughs> the Bible. So the use of language is really important, that when we get past this terrorist or me good guy, British soldier bad guy, and start to understand that we're all on this human journey, and we're all controlled by the people who actually make profit out of this, mm -hmm. then we're getting somewhere to understanding the problem. But it takes a real degree of honest, honesty, and I will now honestly say, yes, I was a terrorist. I was a terrorist. Mm -hmm. A legal one. A legal one. <laughs> okay. Maybe one more, are we okay? Thank you very much for coming, but I'm going to hand over to Spike, who's just going to finish for the evening, uh, and hand over to you. Uh, it's a very short poem called No Man's Land. And no man's land will be as one, no need to fight or kill. In no man's land there are no kings or rich man's gut to fill. So when the guns at last go silent and the drums no longer beat as we awaken to our madness in no man's land we'll meet. Pat Chirney. Thank you.